Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about how we built a multi-tenant cluster at the University of Applied Sciences, Hamburg, uh, the HAW. Uh, it's, it's always odd to say it in English, so I'm just going to say it in German. <laughs> HAW, not HAW. People don't understand it. And uh, yeah, so to start right away, first two things about universities, because uh, it's a bit of a special use case for um, running Kubernetes and that kind of things. The first thing is that um, the wide range of experiences that we have in the university and that we also want to support. So it all starts with that in the lower semesters. People just come in and probably don't know anything about computing or computer science or anything at all. So they just want to try out stuff, run a database maybe without knowing what that actually is it means at first. Over time they advance to the second stage which could be that, uh, and they try to get more uh, involved with things and uh, try more things out uh, up to the bachelors. And it ends up here where you go all crazy if you enter the research project and the master thesis or whatever and um, try to flip the GPU upside down underwater and try to render some weird shit on that uh, with TensorFlow or whatever. So that's the thing that we really want to support the whole range here from easy to very complex uh, setups that also are demanding and can run large workloads. <clears throat> the other thing about universities is how resources work at universities and how they are managed and how they are... I, I just show you the picture. It's actually like this. I could just as well have taken something like Game of Thrones, but essentially I'm not sure about the rights here, so this is it. And <laughs> Resources at universities are much like little kingdoms. So there's always a research group, several professors, other people that get their resources and gather them, uh, fence them, and somehow manage them by themselves. They don't really like to share them a lot because they always are afraid that people, I don't know, take their resources and don't give them back. So with these two things in mind, we come to the requirements of why we set out to build a cluster. The first thing was that we, uh, that we wanted to have a flexible, compute resource offering. We started out with VMware and OpenStack and Open Nebula and, and went through all that and then experimented with Docker on multiple hosts, on VMs, um, but essentially uh, this, all of that wasn't flexible enough. So because we have this variety of workloads, students want to try new technologies, host small services or, or even, even larger services, research projects want to host their websites, um, run services as well, whatever that may be, up to large workloads in the cloud, uh, the terabyte big data research project, whatever. So everything must be simple to use, but also allow for complex setups. And also unlike other companies maybe, we have a very large variety in technologies. So we have all of this, <laughs> but we also have stuff like Prolog or Haskell, Erlang, whatever people come up with and want to try. Number-wise, we have a thousand plus students at the moment in the computer science department, so that's the user base we have for the cluster. And why did we bother to build it up by ourselves? Because as a university, we have a hard time buying anything from any of the large providers like AWS, GKE, etc. I mean, you theoretically can do that, but you really don't want to go through the process of doing that. It's, no, you don't want it. So, what does it mean, a multi-tenancy at the Harvey. Um, how it usually works is that the lab and the research projects usually buy their own resources. That means that at the beginning of the three-year project you get some money that you've uh, granted and um, you get some students, they figure out what to buy, they, they go through the process of buying it, that usually takes a half a year or something. Then you have the resources, they spend time um, building whatever they got up and at the end of the three years, they have it up and running and maybe did something with it, but then the project is over, students leave, money wasted. You also end up with a large vendor variety here. Uh, we now have, we have Fujitsu, Dell, IBM, Supermicro and some other stuff, I don't remember. So it's very hard to maintain if you are left with all of that stuff. So our, our objective here was uh, to really consolidate the heterogeneous environments that we have, just build a common abstraction layer about all of that to defragmentize our data center that we have or the two data centers we have and to also democratize compute resources because usually people get much more hardware than they actually can use and most of it just um, sits in the data center, consumes power, cooling, space and is actually idling. So we 
also said, okay, that is enough. That is not what we want. As I said, between Kubernetes and containers and nothing, we also had all stages of VMs, but eventually, this is what I left out here because of the limited time, eventually we ended up at containers, containers to the rescue, you know it, it's lightweight, fast, flexible, etc. But we need orchestration to run them at scale, and at that point in time we enter Kubernetes. So when we started out looking at Kubernetes, which was um, roughly two years ago, we were looking at um, the problem, do we want to run a multiple clusters or not? And when you look at all the different tooling that you see, you can have a cluster stand up in no time with KubeSpray and other things. You can also go to the cloud providers and you can also go through all those vendors that provide you with uh, stuff that essentially does Kubeception, Giant Swarm and the like. But we thought about it and said, what do we really want to provide to students? And if you have, here's a cluster, have fun, that still requires the skill somehow to run KRS. So in the end, you still need to know what is going on. And even if the setup is automated, it still leaves the configuration of the stuff in the cluster to you. So you still have to think about what you do and how you do that. And it doesn't help in error cases. If something goes wrong, you have to hope that the tooling you choose somehow helps you or that you can ask somebody who can help you. So um, that would bring us back to students having to know what they are actually doing there with their research project and it'll consume time that they don't have. And essentially, you have the same provisioning problem as with VMs, which is um, who gets how many resources and when. We always had people coming in and say, hey, I want 10 cores for my VM. Yeah, why? Because I need it tomorrow, but afterwards not. So what do you do? Do you provide 10 cores and 40 gigs of memory for a peak workload or not? With VMs, this is a hard thing. You have to shut them down. You have to reprovision them, etc., etc. So we said, no, we go to a single cluster. One just one large cluster for everybody. We also went into the, into the community and had some chats with other people like David Oppenheimer from Google. <clears throat> and he essentially said, well, an, a goal of a, of a single cluster would be not needing to run and, uh, and deploy and, and also monitor multiple clusters, which essentially is what they had to do in order to run GKE at Google. It's a bit, hard, it's a bit of a larger scale, of course, but uh, yeah. And also Quentin Hull said, who is now at, at UI, that um, you of course also can bring down the resource cost <coughs> estimation uh, and consideration. So with the hardware we now have at the university, we can probably run all of the workloads for the next five to six years without actually buying anything, just because we can consolidate them now. So we said to the multi-tenant cluster we go without knowing whether or not that would actually work. Uh, because I went to KubeCon in, uh, last year to Berlin and asked a couple of people and everybody said to me, multi-tenancy, the way you want to do it, it's called hard multi-tenancy. That's not a use case. No one's doing that. Don't do it. No one's doing it. It's not a use case. We now have a multi-tenancy work group. But okay. um, so we, we just set out and say, okay, how do you do that? We don't want to go KubeSpray or any of that. We do it the hard way. There's this Kelsey Hightower repository for Kubernetes the hard way. It's essentially just runs you through what you have to do, what all the tools do in order to set up a cluster. And we started out with three VMs as the master nodes, three worker nodes of some of the stuff we had lying around, and a five node etcd cluster and a canal as overlay network solution because we thought that was a good idea at that time. Um, so we spent two months, dug into that stuff, and finally came out of the rabbit hole with a, a working cluster that we could use. And we said, okay, cool, I can log in with my, or can, I can use it with my admin token. Now, how do we get the thousand students in? And that's when we said, okay, we need AAA. We need auth n, that is, who can access the cluster. We need auth the, uh, what can they access? And we need admission, how much can they use of that, what that they can access? So we just started out with auth n. And we said, okay, of course, we want people to lock in with their, uh, with their university credentials that come from LDAP. And I said, yeah, cool. Let's just key on the LDAP settings into the KRS LDAP module. That was my thinking. Until I found out that there is no such thing as a user in Kubernetes. That you can act, I mean, there is something like it, but not really. There's another first class citizen in the cluster thingy. But they do have an auth token webhook, which is something that you can 
configure to that whenever you want to do something to the cluster, you provide a token that gets sent to that webhook service that you just configured, and then that service does something, validates the token, or uh, validates your credentials, and then says yes or no. <coughs> so we found this Kubernetes LDAP service, uh, which was created by a printer uh, for Kismatic. And by the way, at this year's KubeCon, we also found out that the Bloomberg guys also use it. And we actually worked together on that without knowing each other, which was kind of fun. So we forked that and um, created it uh, in a way that was suitable to work for us. You have to integrate it into your API server, but this is just a detail here that we can leave out for now. And here's just how it works. So you've got two, uh, two tools, you've got kubectl and you've got kubelogin, as I said, and you run kubelogin against uh, the LDAP auth endpoint of the, K, uh, of the K, K and S LDAP service which then attempts the bind, which if it goes okay, then uh, turns the KLS LDAP service into issuing a token, which gets used by kubelogin to write it to kubectl, and then you can fire any API call, the token gets validated by the KLS LDAP service, and eventually returns an okay or not okay, and then you can proceed as usual. Of course, this validation doesn't uh, always happen, it's just uh, it gets cached for 30 minutes, so we don't have to do the callback to the LDAP service all the time. Essentially, if you run kubelogin, this is how it looks like. Just output some stuff, it sets a default namespace, it activates <coughs> the context that you have, because you can have multiple contexts in uh, your kube um, CTL config file, if you, if you work with multiple clusters. And essentially, kubelogin is just a turnkey solution for the users to be able to start right away using kubectl against the cluster. So that's how we brought in the users to use um, the cluster, so they can now authenticate. Now the big thing was of the of the Z. How can we say what they can actually access? How do we separate all of them? How do we make sure that they can't access their services vice versa if they don't want it to? So we needed a source of truth for that kind of information. Of course, we we also could have set up all of that by ourselves, which was not an option, but uh, just one and a half year ago, we introduced GitLab into the whole uh, lab of computer science for all of the students. And by now, the majority of project and coursework at the Harvey is done in GitLab. So everybody is in GitLab, essentially. Which then brought up the idea of, can we integrate GitLab with Kubernetes? And it turned out we, that it is possible. So we built a GitLab integrator service, which does a couple of things. So the first thing it does it maps groups, project, and personal repositories to namespaces. So for every group and every project and every combination of the two, and every personal repository you have, you get a namespace in Kubernetes. You then uh, take the user roles that are mapped to the projects in, in GitLab and create role bindings in Kubernetes for those roles and users um, in conjunction with RBAC roles. Um, yeah, that just reflect what you can do in your project in the namespace. So if you are a master in the project or an owner, you can also write and delete pods. If you're just a developer, you can just read them, see logs and stuff. And the same goes for a reporter, I think, at the moment, yeah. It also applies pod security policies to make sure that people can't break out of, of things, that they cannot run privileged pods, etc. Uh, it also provides the Docker registry secrets, uh, which is something that we just now dropped because we are now using the GitLab uh, registry as of the beginning of this week. And the whole thing works um, with two feature or two ways actually. The one is a webhook feature that immediately creates a namespace and all the role bindings and everything as soon as you create a new project. And the other one is a full sync that runs every three hours to make sure that everything is the way it should be. It also cleans up so that if there is anything that that shouldn't be there, like a role binding that somehow appeared there, it just gets erased. Which was almost a good idea, so we had to uh, build in a feature to exclude some namespaces from this cleanup thingy, uh, for instance, cube system. Um, yeah. And it also sets up the remote or uh, the reverse integration of Kubernetes with GitLab, so once you create a project, you are totally set up to use the cluster, to log into the cluster, to have access to a namespace uh, that adheres to the name that you provided for your project. And you can also directly deploy from your project through a GitLab pipeline into the cluster. 
And conveniently enough, the, uh, the GitLab pipeline also runs in the cluster, so you are directly in the cluster and can use the in-cluster config from within your build pipeline. The service can run inside of the cluster externally and is also available on GitHub. Uh, I can share the link later if anybody is interested. At the moment, though, that service is at a point where it does too many things from a microservice uh, point of view. It was also only meant as a first shot because we needed something that worked. We are now uh, in the process of re-engineering the whole thing into something that we called uh, the tenant operator. And this is not just our way of doing it. We are also discussing this with the multi-tenancy workgroup that has been founded at the beginning of this year in the greater community. And there has been a lot of talks and discussions uh, in the Slack channel, in the mailing list, in the different Google Docs. Uh, we had a deep dive session at uh, KubeCon in Copenhagen. Where's the video here? So if you're interested in the, in the topic of multi-tenancy at all, just join in. We just found out, for instance, that uh, the Blomberg guys actually built a tenant operator that can do pretty much what we wanted it to do, except for resource management. So there's that. Now that works pretty well. Uh, for the last thing, the admission. Um, we don't have a sufficient solution for the university scale yet. Uh, yet. At the moment, we have a free-for-all model, so theoretically, everybody can use all of the resources. Um, mysteriously, it hasn't happened yet. We had one guy who tried to mine bitcoins, which was not, <laughs> which didn't go well for him. Let's say it like that. <laughs> we have monitoring, so we can see that he ran uh, four four hello world services that each consumed 40 cores. That was a bit suspicious. <laughs> um, but the idea is that we've come up with the quota system, which is a bit of a hard thing to do as we have um, multiple namespaces per tenant and namespaces are also shared across tenants. So we have to come up with a model that reflects that and we have that. There's a huge design doc for the tenant operator and the tenant CRD objects that we want to build and also clean up objects that just automatically clean up everything but it would just crash this, uh, or exceed the scope of this talk. Uh, one idea is though that you can lease resources between tenants so I can say I want your resources for the weekend or whatever and you can then agree to that and I can use the resources for the weekend for my research or Bitcoin mining or whatever I want to do. Also there's an ongoing discussion that we have. So the current architecture looks like that. On the bottom we have our etcd cluster then we have the Kubernetes thing uh, with the API servers and our nodes. Then we have the integration layer essentially with the LDAP service, the GitLab integrator, and an HA proxy, which in our case is in front of everything. So at the HA proxy, we separate between API traffic and actual application traffic because people can host their own applications in the cluster by simply providing an ingress resource, which then gets picked up um, and a DNS entry is created at the university's DNS server after we say yes to it. We still have that level of, of control here so that people can just host everything. And we also add an SNI rule to uh, the HA proxy so that it can separate these um, acknowledged uh, URLs or domains to forward them directly to the nodes where then the ingress is and they can pick it up. On the upper right level, we have the identity management system, GitLab, and we use Nexus OSS uh, as a cache for. Um, Docker image uh, registry and also for other stuff like NuGet packages, Maven packages, Python packages, all of that kind of stuff. So, uh, have we been ready at that point? No, because we needed more hardware, of course. Uh, so we got uh, our own hardware and I just have this slide here in case anyone is interested in, in, in running something on-prem because we put s quite some time into the hardware selection and also stole parts of it from the GitLab hardware poll that they did two years ago where they asked everybody, hey, we want to go out of the cloud, on-prem, bare metal, what do you think we should get? That was inspired by those results. Uh, we are booting the whole thing via Matchbox over iPixie, so if we want to update anything, we just reboot it, and that's essentially how we do it. We just re-roll our, all, our, all of our nodes during an update, and there's the node update operator that does it automatically, one node at a time. So if we, up, we essentially update with every major release and every minor release of Kubernetes after having checked that all of the things that are in place can actually work with that. And we also roll a small instance as a test cluster where we test drive that stuff before we update the cluster. So at the moment we are at 1.10.3 of Kubernetes. The final thing that we came up with before the details was the storage. How do we do storage? And last year at KubeCon I heard about Rook. 
which is a project to run Ceph as a distributed storage system in the cluster in pods. So you have the Rook operator and you just tell it, hey Rook, uh, please run me Ceph. Here's storage nodes that have disks attached. There were those, uh, the six storage nodes up there. Usually uh, just some HDDs, eight, eight HDDs per node and a big NVMe SSD. And then Rook takes those and creates a Ceph cluster automatically out of that. That project still is in alpha, but is really very, very, very stable already. You have some hiccups sometimes, but so far we haven't had any data loss. And we really pushed it sort of to the limits by migrating the whole cluster in production from one network to another over the uh, past weeks. Uh, and this is just a very recommended project for anyone who needs storage in cluster and potentially has to roll their own. I mean, if you're at a on AWS or whatever, you probably don't want that, but if you're not, then this is really a cool project to go for. They will also now support with the next version other storage backends that are not Ceph. So. Then we have even more. We use the cert manager to provide uh, yeah, certificates from Let's Encrypt to the users also automatically. Uh, the Rook storage is also auto-provisioned, so people just have to say, I want 10 gigs or what, and they, they just get a volume. Uh, we use the Prometheus operator for monitoring. Everybody can just monitor their services and whatever else uh, via Prometheus. We have GP GPU support built in, so people can also run um, TensorFlow stuff, especially great with uh, Jupyter Hub that, that automatically provisions a Jupyter Notebook where you can run experiments on GPU. And it also frees the GPU if you don't use it anymore, but keeps your state in a volume through Rook. And we also built this little thingy that we can then just dynamically add all of the PC pools that we have in the university for normal everyday student work to the cluster. So if somebody wants, he can add up to 1.2 terabytes of memory and 600 cores to the cluster, which is powering up them uh, for experiments, whatever. So everything worked fine without actual users. <laughs> yeah. We had a go live in September 2017. We started out with the hard way in May uh, of 2017, and we had experience in another research project with, with, uh, with Kubernetes for another year before that. So in, this, in May of last year, we decided to do this for the whole university or, or, or for the whole department so far. And then we went live in September. At that time, we had around uh, um, roughly 150 users that were uh, concurrently using the, the cluster, but now we are more like three, 400 users. We had two very heavy users that were doing their master thesis, and they brought down the cluster several times, sort of, which was good because that's, that's what we wanted. So several problems showed up. Um, one of the guys was just automatically creating a lot of pods in the cluster, running workloads. So that then looked like so on our VMware-backed API servers. And especially that was interesting because one gigabit of traffic through the API server is quite unusual, sort of ish. Um, so the control plane went down. Um, especially the API servers were running out of capacity, so we had to crank them up to 32 gigabytes of, of memory, four cores, and for some reason we thought it was a good idea to get um, six API servers, which didn't make that much of a difference. We have 10K roll bindings. Uh, we have a very high pot churn, obviously, and we ended up with discovering that our etcd had 2.2 gigabytes of storage that it consumed. And while that doesn't sound like that much, it actually directly put us into the X-Large cluster segment. Because etcd is a bit of a special database. Uh, upon uh, further investigation, we figured out that etcd has a default storage limit of two gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turned into a state where it only accepted read and delete requests. Mm, and of course, you can increase that I don't know why it is limited, with the quota backend bytes flag, but only up to 8 gigs, so that's maximal. You can run 8 gigs in there, and then they say the whole thing doesn't work, and we can't deliver the latency that we promise you with that technology anymore. So that there's a hard limit at 8 gigabytes. So uh, we increased it, and we effectively had downtime for one day for the control plane. The services in the cluster kept running, but we just couldn't do anything to them, but they could just kept running. Essentially, the users didn't notice that we were sweating as we were, just as my laptop just burned here. Um, 
And the recovery took about seven hours at a full utilization. So all of the API servers, all of the etcd nodes were just burning away. Uh, all the diffs and whatever had uh, turned up meanwhile. So that was quite interesting. That the whole definition of large scale, as you usually find it, totally didn't work for us. And it, con it, just, it just proceeded like that because whenever you look at stuff and you look really deep, they tell you, okay, yeah, this is with 30 pods per node, and we expect you to have these kind of nodes, and then if you have a thousand of them, then you have a large cluster. So we, don't, we are in a different boat here. So the lessons learned from that were large scale is not necessarily bound to the number of nodes. Etcd really is your pet, and you want to make it feel good. Pet as in the pet versus kettle discussion where you care about your pets, but not about your cattle. So we don't care about a single node, we don't care about pods, but we care about etcd now, very lovingly. Uh, Multi-tenancy multi is possible, but complex. There's much more to it. All, all of the security stuff is pretty hard. Whenever you want to run something like logging or monitoring in a multi-tenant way, you really, I mean, essentially you'd have to buy Splunk to provide multi-tenant logging, which on that level would ruin the university if you really buy it. Um, and they couldn't even promise us that it actually would be working. Um, you need especially good monitoring, logging and auditing because you want to know what's going on. You want to see if people start mining Bitcoin. You want to see if they um, end essentially automatically. Um, but the upside, especially for all of the companies that want to use Kubernetes, is that students really loved uh, being able to just leverage the technology and jump on it. And even the professors, after being a bit reluctant in the first place, once they saw what was possible and that students were actually doing pretty cool things with it, uh, jumped on that, and it also sparked a completely new way of, of working together. People that haven't been talking to each other just started talking to each other because they somehow had, a, yeah, I don't know, some kind of a common ground that they, oh, you're doing this to the cluster, cool. I didn't know that was possible, let's talk. Let's do, let's do a research project together. So that was, that was pretty good. What's next? Um, not for me, as I'm leaving, but for everybody else, they will have to enhance the, the node security and container isolation, of course. Uh, there's always more you can do in terms of security, especially as the project matures now. Uh, the tenant operator ecosystem is something that I will keep working on, because we also need that at Figo, to some extent. Um, we'll bring up something pro hopefully that helps us doing the resource management by our self-service so people can just say I, I need more resources and somebody else can then acknowledge that or something. There's also interesting projects like uh, the priorities, uh, it's a priority controller in Kubernetes um, where you can assign priorities to certain services. There's the Cube Arbitrator project which uh, just puts that to steroids by being able to dynamically shift priorities around and move resources around um, so that you can keep your most vital services alive and resourced while others may die. There's the pot toleration restriction controller if you want to do stuff like I can run here but you not and I'm not even allowing you to actually add that, that toleration to your deployment to, to run on here. It's also interesting to have um, special nodes for certain things like builds or whatever. And a new thing that we found at KubeCon is the IPv6 direct routing and vector packet processing stuff from Contif, uh, which essentially was forked or co-developed by Cisco guys, but is not marketed through Cisco. So Contif VPP is the new thing. Uh, does direct routing via VGP between the nodes with vector packet processing and full IPv6 offloading, which is uh, a very interesting and very um, powerful networking solution that we also want to look at. And the idea is to put the whole academic uh, thing that we built uh, onto its own platform, which we call Hypatia.net, uh, because we found that uh, the CERN and several other universities from Berlin, Lübeck, and also Michigan, uh, and, others, uh, and other, other universities from the US are very interested in those kind of solutions. And, um, and most people in the industry sort of have quite different requirements to a cluster. So that's why we sparked this project and ho hopefully people join it and we can continue the work. Yeah. But that was the story of uh, multi-tenancy on Kubernetes for a thousand users. So far it's working quite well. I hope it continues. Thank you. <laughs>